Okay, in this episode, I want to look at the external features, primarily the head and the neck. We're also going to look at the heart and the respiratory tract of the bird. We look here at the head. We see that some birds, like chickens, have a comb. That comb's not very useful for combing hair, but we call it a comb nonetheless. They also have wattles under the chin here. In the chicken, we also see what's referred to as the earlobe. This is a patch of skin just below the external auditory meatus, or the opening of the ear. And one thing to note that in chickens, the color of this generally is the color of the eggs that they lay. Okay, so this is a white egg laying bird. We notice that on turkeys, they have an extra structure that flips over their nose and that is known as the snood. On waterfowl and ajarigars, we see that there's a soft keratinized portion on the beak that is generally colored. This is known as the sear. At least in the case of budgeries, the sear is blue in the male and is generally kind of a brownish pink in the female. So the female is the one that's kind of peeking out of the nest up there, and the male is standing down next to it. Okay, some other external structures. We find that on the dorsal aspect of the base of the tail, there's what is known as the uropygial gland. Okay, this is also known as the preening gland or the oil gland. Basically, this is a sebaceous gland that secretes fatty oil. And when the animal preens, it takes that oil and it spreads it over the feathers for waterproofing. Okay, it also has bacteriostatic properties to prevent skin infections. And then down here, the retrices, that's another word for basically the tail feathers. And so I just want to point that out. Okay, notice over here on the right, we've got the image of a limb distal to the tarsus. It's basically a scaly limb. Okay, this one doesn't have this in particular, but you'll notice that on some birds they have another kind of outgrowth right there, which is known as the spur. And the male bird can use that in battle. So now here I've got a skeleton that's going to show that spur right here. Notice here that the birds very typical of many birds have three toes in front and one toe in back. Okay, so basically their toes are used for scratching the ground. They have very hard claws for that purpose. In running birds such as emus, we may see three toes facing forward without a toe facing behind. Predatory birds like this one here they have very claw-like feet, okay, but often still the three in front and one in back. So those claws are for getting their prey. You see that nearly all songbirds and most of the perching birds have three in front and one toe in back, okay? We see that other perching birds, especially those that climb, such as woodpeckers, but also ospreys, owls, and cuckoos, and most parrots have two toes in front and two toes in back. So that's a little bit better for gripping as they, they climb. Okay, so birds have <laughs> funny toe arrangements. There's even more variety than this, but this is the most common arrangement. Okay, let's have a look at the head, the inner surface of the mouth. We have a tongue which is not nearly as mobile as the tongue that we see in mammals. Okay, so we're opening up here into the oral cavity. And basically, from the beak to the esophagus, we have a combined mouth and pharynx that we're going to call the oral pharynx. We have an opening, the quenae or the quenal cleft. Okay, so since we don't have a soft palate, the place where we have communication between the nasal cavity and the oral cavity 
is this coenal cleft. So in the mammal, we saw that the coenae was the passage from the nasal cavity into the nasopharynx. In birds, we don't have a soft palate, so we're not going to have a nasopharynx. So the coenal cleft is that opening between the nasal cavity and the oral cavity. Caudal to that, we're going to find a little opening, which is the infundibular cleft. Likewise, recall that in that nasopharynx was the opening into the auditory tubes that go to the middle ear. Well, since we don't have a nasopharynx, this is the communication between the oral cavity and the auditory tubes. We then have what we know as the laryngeal mound. Okay, so we don't have a larynx. We don't have vocal cords. We're going to find that the vocal structure is down at the junction of the trachea and the bronchi. We'll see that in a bit. Okay, and so this opening here at the laryngeal mound is the glottis. Come on down to the neck. You can see the trachea here. Now the trachea has complete tracheal rings, okay, unlike the mammal where they're C-shaped. Because of this, you never want to use a cuffed endotracheal tube, okay, it'll do too much damage. We see here the esophagus, okay, we'll look more at the esophagus in a lecture at on the digestive tract, and that's going to come down to the crop, which we see in many species. And likewise, we'll come back to that with the digestive tract. Here on the right side, we see the right jugular vein. It's generally much larger than the left, and it may sometimes be the only jugular vein, okay? This one is generally used for venipuncture. Now let's drop down into the body cavity. So here we see the heart. Now the heart in birds does have four chambers, similar to the mammalian heart. The left ventricle forms the apex, and the right ventricle also wraps around the left ventricle, also very similar to the mammalian heart. Okay, here we see the lungs. So something important to notice here in the bird is we do not have a diaphragm. Okay. So the diaphragm isn't involved in breathing like we see in mammals. We'll talk more about inspiration and expiration with the lungs, but we see here that they're not expanding like what we see in other animals. In the birds, they don't contain alveoli. They contain air capillaries, so the air passes totally through them, so we don't see that expansion of lungs that we see in our other animals. Okay, we're going to come back to that. Here we see the trachea coming down. And right at the bifurcation of the trachea into the bronchi, we see the syrinx. Okay, this is where vocalization occurs in birds. And then from here we go into the primary bronchi. In birds we have what are known as air sacs. Okay. So we're going to have both cranial and caudal air sacs with diverticuli that extend into the pneumatized bones. These kind of act as bellows during respiration. Okay, so during inspiration we're going to see that the ribs are drawn forward and the sternum is lowered. Primarily this occurs by the external intercostal muscles and the costosternal muscles. Fresh air then enters into the trachea, moves through the lungs, with only some air participating in gas exchange, and they move all the way down into the caudal air sacs, which are these here. Okay. The cranial air sacs at this time are going to be receiving air from the lungs that are low in oxygen, which has been displaced by this new air bolus. Okay. Then during expiration, which occurs primarily by the internal intercostals and the abdominal muscles, the relatively fresh air in these caudal air sacs moves through the lungs for gas exchange, and the air in the cranial air sacs is expelled through the trachea. Okay, so we have this unidirectional airflow going through the lungs, and air remains in that respiratory system for two breathing cycles, makes the gas exchange more efficient. 
These air sacs are also important in that they lighten the body, lowering the center of gravity for stabilization during the flight, and they're also thought to partake in heat exchange. And so that's all we have as far as external structures, structures of head and neck, and the heart, and the respiratory system.